Good morning, everybody. I think it's kind of weird to start a, um, you know, a speech with, uh, with smoke and lights and all that, but it's, it's kind of fun. I, I love this, um, you know, this, uh, this welcome that you've got here in Moldova. Um, I wanted to just give a quick shout out to the organizers of this conference. I think they've done a fantastic job with the internet. This is the first conference that I've been to where the internet actually works. So a big thank you to you. Also, it's my first time in Moldova, and I think this is a fascinating market. Um, I hope to come back again uh, sometime. So let me quickly get to this, because I think we're kind of running behind time, and I don't want to take you away from your lunch plans later. Um, so I'm here to talk about the digital trends that I'm seeing for, for this year. So a little bit about me. I'm a career journalist like most of you out here. Um, I've worked in radio, TV, newswires, magazines. Um, I'm former CNBC, Bloomberg, Star TV, and, and um, Yahoo. So I was at Yahoo for about six years. I was running the emerging markets out of Asia. So markets that have very similar trends to what we see over here in Moldova um, and the emerging um, European markets. So I, I love the trends that we're seeing out here. I love the fact that, for example, the internet works spectacularly well uh, in a market like this. Um, I see the growth opportunities and the potential that's out here. So about a year ago, I left Yahoo to go start up a, um, uh, a consultancy. And basically what I'm doing with my clients is that I'm helping them craft their digital transformations, strategies, operations, um, and provide the training for them uh, on that as well. I also do a lot of change management for them. Um, so. I wanted to get to some of the big things that I've seen in these markets. Okay, so some of these are just continuations from what we've seen from 2015. So they're not all that new, but in a, in a sense, this is part of the evolution that's going on in, in the media space today. Trend number one is what Sarah was talking about just now, about the distribution of content, content that lives everywhere, right? So we're seeing the reinvention of the homepage, so to speak. So, where we are today is an evolution of what has been about a 15-year journey in this. Um, version 1.0 of what I would consider the, you know, the web experience was largely a portal-based one in which Yahoo, Microsoft, uh, AOL dominated. So a lot of these um, trends that we've seen over there you know, back then was where you would host the content on your own site, and it was largely a desktop experience. Now, the difference that we've seen was that search started to become a little bit more prominent in version 2.0 of, of the web experience. Um, content was, was also hosted on your own um, own and operated site, but now the discovery had started to change. People were coming in through site doors, such as search. Okay. Version 3.0 was for social. Um, this was what um, Sarah was talking a lot about, about how to build social content and people starting to discover your content through social media. Now, if I could just, there we go. Um, version 4.0 is where we are at today. And this is a syndicated platform model, if you will, where you now have um, content that's hosted on platforms that are not yours. Okay, and this is a big differentiator. Content is, is hosted on social and publishing platforms. Um, some of these are Snapchat, WeChat, um, Facebook, of course, Tumblr. Right, and you also start to see the emergence of newsletters as one of these um, hosts for content. So that's where we are today in terms of platforms. And you know, some of us are calling this the rise of homeless media. And basically what this means is that we no longer have a homepage. And this is an example from now this, which popularized this thinking around homeless um, media, where you no longer have a homepage to go to. Right? So the thinking here is that all your content should reside on sites where people go to, where people spend their time, and that's where you want to be seen. Instant articles on Facebook is a good example of this, of how Facebook is trying to get publishers to publish directly on Facebook, where it makes sense. Um, the, the pages load faster, it's easier for you to discover, and more importantly, for, for both advertisers and publishers alike, it's a chance for you to target your audiences a lot better. You also start to see stuff like this on chat applications, like Line, which is very popular in Asia, uh, where they've also done a very similar concept of onboarding a lot of content onto their own app. Um, I was talking a little bit about newsletters. Quartz is a very good example of a fantastic newsletter service that pushes straight into your, 
to your inbox every day. Um, I find this to be one of the more interesting kind of developments uh, in distributed content. I think it totally makes sense as far as the, the experience goes. No experience is as, as mobile native as email, if you think about it that way. So when you look at this, what, what's a real change here, right? So in the old model, you had publishers speaking directly with the audience through their own platforms, right? What's changed with this now is that you now have to talk to your audience on multiple channels. Everything from Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Apple News, newsletters, Medium, everywhere. So the role of your own website is now secondary to the entire process of reaching a wider audience. So the big question here to ask is, what is your audience's first contact with your brand? And I think this is something to really keep in mind. So I think BuzzFeed is a really good example of how distributed content is being done uh, on a big publisher. Now again, if I can get this working. There we go. And I think this quote basically says it all. Ultimately, a brand does not want a particular post and a piece of media. What they want is a strategy for making content across many networks. Not many companies can compete with us on that, and this comes from the CEO of BuzzFeed. I think that totally makes sense, right? If you were a brand and you wanted to get your message across multiple platforms, BuzzFeed is probably one of the partners that you'd be thinking of. So, trend number two. And this is something that I see happening within one year. The evolution of lock screens, notifications, and apps. So, the way I think about this is that we're, we're very close to coming to the end of the golden age of apps. And Casey Newton at The Verge had a really good quote on this one. To anyone paying attention, it's becoming very apparent that the golden age of apps is coming to a close. And why does he say that? If you look at it, there are basically only three companies that own the top apps. Okay, so, this, so this is a chart of all the top smartphone apps of last year. And if you look closely, it really comes down to three companies. It's Google, it's Facebook, and it's Apple. And that's it. If you are out there trying to push a new app to change people's habits, and you wanted them to read your news on your app, you're going to have a really hard time doing that. Right? The competition is tough. The question to ask is, do we really need a whole app just to do that? So what does it look like if we were to imagine a post-app world? So if you think about it, the lock screen of your phone is a home page, right? This is where everyone begins their journey. And this is news at a glance. You have a quick look at it, you try to figure out what's going on, and based on that, you decide whether to engage with that piece of content or not. And I think this is an incredible point that a lot of publishers are missing today. The fact is, you can pull out your phone, have a quick glance at what's going on, and decide whether you want to engage with that piece of content. Now, if you think about this, what would it be like, say, five years from now, and you imagine having to pull out your phone from your pocket, swipe the lock screen, put in your password, open an app, find the news that you want. That's where we are today. Ten years from now, you'd be looking at this and you'd be going, this is kind of ridiculous. Why did we even do that? Right? So I believe that there is a, a, large, a large opportunity for content to be pushed straight to lock screens and in a manner that's short, brief, and very compelling. Um, so I moved to Android only about eight months ago. And I moved to Android largely for the lock screen service, which I think is quite incredible. If you, I, you know, most of you probably have iOS devices as well, so you understand the pain that you go through. The moment you unlock that screen, all your notifications are gone, and you have a hard time trying to drill back down to figure out you know, what was sent to you. I think Android does a fantastic job with this, and I, and I can see them making a lot of uh, um, headway on this one. Some of you on Android would already know of Google Now, for example, which pushes very good content to you in the home, in the home screen experience. So there are others who are starting to think about this. Um, Facebook recently launched um, something similar, right? Um, 
It's called Notify, and what Notify does is that it aggregates um, breaking news stories and puts it on your lock screen. Their belief is that push notification is going to be one key way in which people consume and discover content, and they want to be a part of that. So ask yourself this. If you had to build a content publisher from scratch today that only lives on the lock screen, what would it look like? And I think we're going to see some really interesting examples this year. Right, ad blockers. How many of you have ad, block ad blockers on your phones? Very healthy, not many. Good for publishers and, uh, and clients, I think. Um, so this is a thing that's not going away. It's an ongoing disruption that's happening in this space. And if you look at these numbers, um, the trend is obviously uh, on, on the rise. And this was a problem that we as publishers created. We created very heavy um, article pages. We crammed it up with not just editorial content, but also advertising content that's, that's weighed down a lot of these pages. The load speeds are terrible across some of these um, uh, platforms. Um, and for those of you, who, you know, who, who live and die by 3G and 4G data networks in your countries, you know exactly how painful this can be sometimes. So this is an ongoing problem, and I think you know, we'll see some, some interesting resolutions this year. Um, someone's also making money from this, and I thought this was quite interesting. So as a publisher, you push content, content through um, telcos, and then telcos push it to the user. Now what's going to happen one day, and I think that day has already arrived, um, where telcos are starting to say, we don't want to push ads anymore to our users. If you want an ad to be shown to a user, you're going to have to pay us for it. So telcos are, are intervening in the middle of this process and, um, and starting to disrupt that field as well. And I think we'll see more of this. Okay, trend number four, bots. Um, I, love, I love talking about bots. I can go on all day talking about this stuff. And I think there's a, there's a session later on bots as well. Um, what's interesting is that this is going to change the way we work in these rooms. Um, a lot of these changes you'll see within this year itself. This is a really interesting uh, shift that we've seen in the last um, year or so. Automated Insights is a startup that basically takes structured data like this in a CSV format and turns it into an article. There you go. Um, and what it does is that it takes a number, drops it into a field, and automates the process of reporting. And what they've done in this particular use case is to take um, SEC data or anything around um, funds and markets, um, stock markets in particular, and basically churn out automated articles around it. But that's not just, well, that's just one example of what you can do with bots. Um, Slack is a great example, again, of what you can do in, in newsrooms. The key here is to think of Slack as an operating system. What if you were to think of Slack as an operating system where you wrote great bots and apps to do the things that you needed to do? The New York Times has a really great example of this one called Blossom. What Blossom does is, it, is that it helps editors decide what kind of content to run on, um, on Facebook. So what it does is that it looks through all the old historical data around what did well on Facebook, and, all, and then it starts to compare that with the content that already resides within the New York Times. And it basically says to the editor, if you want to get the results that you want, you should publish this today at this time. I'm getting the one minute cue here, so let me quickly skim through this. Um, this is how you think about it. If this happens, then do this on Slack, right? And this is a template for the future of, um, of Slack and newsrooms. If the stock market drops 5%, send me an email, notify the newsroom, notify the stock reporter. Um, if I have a big Fed meeting today, notify the economics team, right? So you see how this stuff goes. Now, Slack is also spending a lot of money trying to groom and grow um, this field. Uh, they've put aside $80 million to accelerate some of the great ideas that are out there. Okay, now think about it this way. What would it be like if we could teach algorithms to recognize, recommend, and craft stories for us? Right? This is quite an interesting idea. 
have any of you tried Crystal? It's called crystalnose.com. What Crystal does is really amazing. It takes a look at your profile as a person based on what's available publicly and basically comes up with a very clear synopsis of who you are. And the use case for this is quite simple. If you were trying to reach me, for example, with a pitch, how would you write to me? What kind of emails do I like to read or which emails will I respond to? So I don't know how they do this, but it's like magic, right? This is absolutely true about me. So if you think about this, right, it knows a little bit more about you. It knows how you like your, your emails to be sent to you. Um, it gives you a very good idea of the reader. If you were to take this a bit further, what if something like this could start writing articles that were pinpointed at you as an individual? So a newsroom would generate one single piece of content, feed it through a system like Crystal, and Crystal will generate a story using words, using brevity, using comprehensiveness that you appreciate and that you enjoy. So if you think about it, one story that you write as a newsroom could target 10, 20, 30, 100 different people, 100 different profiles. And I think we're gonna be there fairly soon. If you think about this in terms of a Spotify model, how amazing would it be if we were to think about stories as a playlist, right? On Spotify, Spotify is so good at, at helping you discover songs that they know that you like based on your profile, based on what you've listened to before, what you've liked. Why can't we do that for articles? If I finish reading story A, automatically give me story B because you know that that's what I'm gonna like. And we're not there yet, right? So, final thought for everyone here. Imagine a future like this, where you could say to your phone or to your watch, my Uber arrives in two minutes, give me something quick to read. And your phone should automatically know exactly what's going on. For one, the phone knows that your Uber is arriving in two minutes anyway, because that's where you book it, right? Second, it should quickly be able to pull out whatever's out there streamline it, curate it, and just give you exactly what you want because you only have two minutes. So I hope that day is going to come soon because I know we're always running out of time as I am right now. So thank you, everybody.